Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and it's time for your weekly wrap up and we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about today including Verizon's LTE service versus my Comcast service. Uh, believe it or not, Verizon is a lot faster these days on the upstream. Uh, that led me to thinking about marketing and these internet plans and how many providers market downstream versus upstream. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to talk about another benefit of Windows 10 Pro that I missed in my comparison last week. I will also add on to our discussion last week about Chrome end of life and look at some other PC end of life discussions for various operating systems. I'm also going to talk about Plex and what I use it for. A viewer asked about that. And related to that, we're going to look at ways that you can adjust your HD home run channel lineup. So a whole bunch of different topics today. Let's get to it. And I want to thank our newest supporters here on the channel, including Larry Interlande, who gave via our donor box page, Carol Chermazinski, uh, I hope I got that right, uh, who was a super chat contributor to some experiments we were doing with live streaming related to the VidDU Go that we looked at last week. And Douglas Barnum is a new member uh, of the YouTube channel here through YouTube's member support. And what we talked about last week related to Patreon is that I like to provide as many options as possible. So as you can see here, we've got a lot of different ways to support the channel. And I want to thank these folks for contributing, everyone else who's been contributing on an ongoing basis, and everyone who watches on an ongoing basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. And if you did contribute and don't see your name on here, don't worry. I uh, am shooting this video a couple of days earlier than I usually do, so you will show up uh, on next week's wrap up. And again, wanna thank everyone for their support. Now let's take a look at the week in review. We didn't do a week in review last week because I had so much other stuff taking up time in the video, but uh, what we uploaded to the Extras channel uh, from the last time we talked about the Extras channel, you can see here up on screen, we have the Teradek Video Go unboxing. Uh, we did a test stream of the Teradek Video Go with a 15 megabit per second stream from the beach, and it was pretty cool that it worked by uh, splitting up the data between a Wi-Fi connection and two cellular connections, and it was really flawless. We even were able to send stuff to two different uh, streaming services, so that was fun. Uh, we also unboxed the Shuttle XPC Slim that we reviewed this week along with the Elgato uh, Thunderbolt 3 Pro Dock. And then on the main channel, we looked at a couple of things. A few of them haven't yet uploaded at the time I'm recording this, but hopefully they will all be there by the time you see this. Uh, we had that Shuttle PC review. Oddly enough, when I uploaded the video, uh, YouTube, when it transcoded it, had some issues. It was like flashing my logo up randomly at different points in the video. So I had to delete it and then re-upload it. And it was killing me because it already had a thousand views by the time I did that. So thank you all for uh, watching it again if you saw it pop up on your feed. Uh, we'll also have the full review of the video go. I liked it so much, I'm probably going to get one to uh, maybe make more reliable live streams happen here on the channel. And then we also looked at the setup of a five bay Synology NAS that just came out. I think this is the 1019 plus. It's about a $700, $800 device. And uh, I stepped through all of the initial setup with it. And then later on uh, this week, we'll have a review of that device and what separates it from some of the lower cost options out there. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind. And this is week 103 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And I want to complain a little bit more about Comcast this week. I'm sorry for being such a broken record on this company, but it's just impeding my ability to grow this business, and it's been driving me crazy. Uh, we will say something nice about Comcast, though, at the end of this segment. So don't worry, it's not all bad, but I do want to just bring something to your attention. So where I live, the fastest upstream speed I can get uh, at my house here is about 12 megabits per second. I am on the top tier, and that includes even the business plans. I can't do more than that. Uh, some of you know I was trying to get their Gigabit Pro service installed here, which is a direct fiber connection with two, gigabyte, two gigabits per second symmetrical. Uh, I was not eligible for that after they did their on-site survey because they thought I was only 700 feet away from the nearest node to plug into, but as it turns out, I am 38,000 feet away, and it was not going to be a cost-effective installation for either party. So... I went, you know, just around town the other day because I was playing around with that video go and I was wondering how Verizon's service has improved over the years and I pulled into my Dunkin Donuts parking lot to get my coffee and I ran a quick speed test and to my shock here, I've got 50 megabits per second symmetrical on my smartphone 
yet I can't get anywhere near this speed uploading uh, on my hardwired connection. It just drives me crazy that they just can't deliver what I need and I'm willing to pay for. Uh, but this is what you deal with when you have these regional monopolies that are not under pressure to provide better service. We're seeing them starting to offer their uh, cable-based or their coax-based gigabit service in areas where we have more competition in the state. But where I live, where Comcast is really the only game in town for this kind of internet connection, uh, they are just kind of dragging their feet. Now, it's really fascinating, though, to look at Comcast's marketing of their internet plans. They never talk about upstream. They assume that everyone just wants to consume, consume, consume. And that might just be a corporate strategy or philosophy because for a long time that's all they did was provide content that you watched and now of course we're in a, a two-way communication era but nonetheless this is how they're still offering things to folks and I think it's actually more about their cost than it is about what consumers are really in need of. Uh, even when you look at the uh, business plans here, again, it is all focused on consumption. When I called the business office to see if there were faster upload speeds in my area, uh, the guy I talked to said, oh yeah, it's 300. I said, yes, 300 down. Is it 300 up also? He said, yeah, it's 300 in both directions. Then he called me back an hour later and said, oh, I made a mistake. It's only 12 up like you have now. And I said, forget it, because they wanted to charge like twice as much for this business plan versus my uh, personal cable account. And the other thing that bothers me about the direction they're taking here is that they are communicating this to policymakers like they're doing something good here to make them not be so concerned about the large regional monopoly that they have. So this press release was one that I got uh, last April when they started rolling out gigabit internet service in Connecticut. Uh, this was a year ago, almost a year ago now, and they were talking about how this is going to be all over the state. Guess what? It still isn't where I am, nor in many other parts of the state that are lacking regional competition. Uh, and again, all focused on downstream. And again, focused on publications that cover state policy. And I think if lawmakers were getting concerned that we were falling behind on broadband here, they would read this and say, hey, everything is good here. We're in good shape. Comcast is making progress. It's pretty reasonably priced. Uh, but they made no mention of upstream in this, and it wasn't until I uh, contacted the PR rep for clarification that I learned that it was 35 and not even close to even half the uh, downstream speed here. And they are just dragging their feet on this because I think it'll cost them a small fortune uh, to upgrade all their equipment to support some of the symmetrical gigabit speeds that the DOCSIS 3.1 technology can provide. They've got to probably change out cable nodes. They've got to change out amplifiers. And uh, so long as they are not getting consumers excited about uploading, they don't have to worry about having to upgrade that equipment that quickly. And I think that's really what is driving a lot of this here. It's cost, and when they don't have competition, uh, there's no need to be really fast about this, especially if they can keep consumers and policymakers distracted by downstream performance. And I think this is holding us back in many areas. Now, there is some competition in my state. We've talked about Go NetSpeed before. Uh, this is a small uh, fiber provider that started operating in the Hartford area in Connecticut, where I live. Unfortunately, this is about 45 miles away from where I am currently stationed, so uh, they will not be able to come to me and offer this service. But look at what they're marketing here versus Comcast. Upload and download. In fact, they're not saying download and upload. Uh, they are focusing on the fact that they provide a much faster upload connection for folks, and I think that's really important. And I'm really eager to see what Comcast does in that area uh, in response to the fact that this little scrappy startup is offering a very competitively priced product. In fact, I believe they are guaranteeing this price for life if people sign up. Uh, so that's another advantage that they've got there. And uh, it looks to be a really good service from the people that I've talked to that have it. And the other day I stopped by my friend's house who does have this service and uh, just on a Wi-Fi connection, which wasn't so great, I was getting uh, some really decent upload speeds. And I'm going to go back there and we'll uh, hook up some stuff to the Ethernet there and see how it really plays out just to see what a nice symmetrical fiber connection is like. Because I know a lot of you don't have access to this as I don't, and I'm eager just to play with it. So we'll do a video up there in the next couple of weeks about uh, what it's like to have one of these connections and uh, see where it goes. Incidentally, I did try to get these folks on for an interview, but they didn't want to talk about federal policy related to net neutrality. They didn't really want to talk about state policy. Uh, they didn't want to talk about their infrastructure. So it was really hard to actually have anything to talk about. 
uh, but maybe we'll offer it to them again and see if they'd like to talk about what it's like to be a little uh, internet provider competing against the big guys. I think it's a fascinating story, and it's unfortunate that they didn't really want to talk about any of those things. But nonetheless, we'll uh, poke around here and see what this is all about. Now, I don't want to just complain and dump on Comcast all the time because they are actually pretty good on Twitter with customer service. And here's my tip for you. If you ever have a problem with your Comcast service, don't bother calling. Just tweet. And you can even tweet out into the air. They'll find you and respond. So uh, what I did is I posted up this snarky tweet about the fact that my uh, Dunkin' Donuts parking lot here has a better uh, upstream connection than my house does. Uh, incidentally, I could probably drive to the Dunkin' Donuts and upload a video and still save time, which I might start doing because I have 20 gigs a month I can use for tethered connections on my Verizon account. Uh, nonetheless, though, um, they almost quickly, almost immediately wrote back to me saying, hey, thank you for reaching out through Twitter. I uh, would love to look into this internet issue for you. Can you please DM me? So I you know, DM'd them and said, look, you know, this is not a problem with my service, but it's a problem with the offering that you have. And they said, well, we still want to check your account anyhow. So I sent them my information. They ran a test. And sure enough, there's something wrong with my internet connection. I don't know what it is because everything seems to be working fine, but they did notice something. And I've got a tech now coming here in about two hours or so uh, to check it out. And that was all yesterday. So they actually do, I think, a pretty nice job of monitoring social media and trying to solve problems for you. And I just wish the company would offer more. And I'm willing to pay for it. I'm even willing to forgive the fact that they're a regional monopoly with no competition if I could just get some better upstream speed uh, to run my business. But nonetheless, they are good at customer service on Twitter of all places. And I think if you have a problem, go there first. Now, this next topic kind of erupted right before I started recording the wrap-up this week. It involves The Verge, which is a very popular uh, tech website and YouTube channel and multi-platform uh, kind of media business. They're owned by Vox Media, which is another large internet media provider out there. And a few months ago, they uh, did a kind of a crazy thing. They had an inexperienced guy put together a PC on a video for their YouTube channel. And for anyone that's ever built a PC and recorded it and put it on YouTube, uh, you know that you're opening the door for a lot of discussion, critiques, and criticism because there is a right way to do things, there's a sort of right way to do things, and then there's a whole bunch of ways you can do things incorrectly yet still get a working PC. I think this guy probably did all of the above and it generated a ton of videos that uh, came up in response to what he did. And I kind of feel sorry for the guy because I feel like he was probably assigned the story, he'd never built a PC before, and uh, here you go. So nonetheless, there was a couple of creators that I uh, made some commentary on it. I know one of the ones that I saw was from uh, Rich at Review Tech USA, who's got a great channel where he commentates or comments on uh, tech and gaming issues. And the other day, months after this happened, uh, Rich here, along with a number of other creators, uh, got copyright strikes on that video. Not even a content ID flag, but an actual takedown. And what's worse is that this was apparently a manual takedown where somebody actually had to go in and initiate it. It wasn't just a blind match on uh, the content ID system. Uh, so now what's happened since these takedowns were issued is that they have since uh, been reversed. Um, Kyle here from Bitwick Kyle uh, was another one that got hit with this. And it looks like YouTube is uh, denying the takedown uh, after Kyle appealed it. Uh, and it looks like things are moving now in the right direction. But it really concerns me that we've got a large media organization that is picking on these little media organizations months after uh, this criticism was posted. And these copyright strikes can destroy your YouTube business. If you get two or three of them, you're done for the most part. And I'm glad to see YouTube in this instance was, is standing up for somebody. But this really does speak to the fact that fair use is not the law. It's a defense, but unfortunately to defend something you have to put yourself into an environment where you can have that uh, dispute listened to by a judge or some other party. Thankfully again here YouTube has decided to agree with the creators, but that doesn't always happen. And again, us little guys and gals are really at a disadvantage against these larger companies who have lawyers who could continually silence criticism. But what's really funny about this whole story is that two or three days before they issued these copyright strikes, The Verge had a story about copyright strike extortion. And this was a story about uh, how there are false copyright claims being made against YouTube creators, and the people making those claims are asking for ransom to release them. 
Uh, YouTube has been combating this now, but it's putting people really in a bad place because they can get knocked off the platform for a couple of days while these things get worked out. And inside this article, though, was this line, and this was kind of editorializing by the reporter whose uh, name is Shoshana Wodinsky, but nonetheless, their editors included it. This isn't the first time that YouTube's less than perfect copyright system, again, an editorialized opinion, has stabbed creators in the back, another editorialized opinion. The platform's hands-off approach to moderation has allowed copyright trolls to thrive for years, not only to extort money, but to dox, slander, or troll. They can also be used to suppress negative news. Some companies have served comedians with copyright strikes in attempts to stifle any videos mocking their brand. And this is exactly what they did two days later. I don't know if they got the idea from the article or what, but the timing here is not good. This article was published on February 11th, and I believe these copyright strikes were issued on February 12th or 13th. So do the math there, but it's just kind of funny that this happens. All right, I'm sorry to jump into the middle of this segment with this poorly formatted video. I'm actually away at the moment, and I shot the weekly wrap up a few days early because I was going to be away. So I apologize, but uh, The Verge did issue a statement and it's as bad as I hoped it would not be. Uh, so it turns out they did go through all of the critical videos that they had uh, received or noticed on the internet in regards to that PC build from months ago. And they picked out two that they thought they had some ground against on copyright terms. Rich's video and the 8-bit uh, with Kyle video. Both were using apparently longer portions of the original than some of the other critical videos were, and those were the two that they went after. It looks like it was the legal department that did that and not editorial, but nonetheless, the message is clear. Uh, they were trying to go after smaller creators in a brand protection effort here uh, to silence critics and really, by extension, uh, prevent future criticism by others. Because if you know that The Verge is going to go after you for criticizing them, you might think twice about doing that. On YouTube, what's interesting, if you look at The Verge's Social Blade statistics, they, they're a pretty sizable channel as a YouTube channel, but uh, there are a lot of independent creators that are larger, uh, many with smaller numbers of, of subscribers, but actually get more traffic and more viewership from week to week. And they have some competitive issues here that I'm, I think are probably driving a lot of this. Uh, what we found in the tech industry, or any industry for that matter, that when you have a large incumbent organization like these media companies, uh, you have a scenario where you might start to feel threatened by some young scrappy startups that don't have the overhead costs that you have. And what's happened throughout history is that these larger conglomerates go out and sue to try to slow the competitors down or put them out of business. Sony did that with emulators back in the uh, early 90s when there was emulation software being released for personal computers at the time. There's many other examples of this going on as well, and it looks like that's what The Verge was doing. It came from their legal department. I'm sure there was some corporate discussion about it. Uh, Nilay Patel, the editor, said, denies any knowledge of all this happening, but he agreed with their uh, legal standing, so take that for what it's worth. And I, I think this is just what the, the era that we're in. We're going to see more and more of this. And I'll tell you what, Rich and Kyle had guts to oppose those DMCA takedown requests because as I just talked about in the pre-recorded segment, if you do that, uh, your next step is court if your uh, adversary wishes to take it there. And they had the money to do that and Rich and Kyle certainly did not. H3H3 H3 Productions just went through something similar where it cost them $100,000 to defend themselves. And remember, fair use is a defense, not the law. So every time you want to argue fair use in your use of content where you're criticizing something, you have to be prepared to go to the mat and pay for it. And that, I think, is what The Verge was trying to do here, was really to send a message out there that be careful about what you do to our big conglomerate here because we might come after you. So that's the end of this story for now. Uh, the other thing that bothers me, and I'm going to link to um, Boogie2988's uh, commentary down in the comments below because I think his, his synopsis really sums up my feelings on the matter. Uh, because the other thing the Verge people began doing after that was talking about a bunch of death threats that they got uh, from people who were commenting on this whole thing. And I, I, for, for, first of all, people should not be making death threats to anybody. And if they were threatened, then they should report it to the authorities, and those authorities should prosecute whoever did that. Certainly, uh, Google knows who they are and can probably find them very quickly, and in many cases, it's probably some kids who need a strong talking to from their parents. But nonetheless, the discussion from their end tried to pivot to a couple of trolls that emailed them versus actually talking about why they did what they did. They can deny things all they want, but the reality is 
Uh, they have not commented on what the motivation behind making these takedown requests were. And ultimately, that is uh, my concern here moving forward, because clearly they made a decision uh, to try to shut some people up that they didn't like. And thankfully, uh, the world came up to defend them. But this is going to keep happening. And I think it's a real uh, problem here moving forward. And unfortunately, there's really no way to fix it other than supporting your creators when these injustices occur. So we're okay for now, but this won't be the last time we hear about this. I can guarantee you that. And we'll move on now with the rest of the wrap up. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And we're going to continue some discussions we started last week to begin with. Uh, this first comment came in from Digital Guy about some of the differences between Windows Pro and Home that we talked about last week. And one of the things that I didn't even know about on Pro is that you can pause updates. And that was something Digital Guy pointed out in his comment here. Uh, so you can go onto this page to learn more about it. But if you are on Windows 10 Pro, you can go into your update settings in the control panel and actually pause them so they don't interrupt your work. Now on Windows 10 Home, when the update is ready, you can schedule when it installs, but you really can't get around it. It's going to install at some point, sometimes when it's not always convenient. Pro will give you the ability to hit the pause button, but they do note that after a certain amount of time, or if you cancel the pause, you'll need to get yourself up to date before they let you pause again. But if you've been frustrated over your Windows 10 updates taking over your life, you can regain a little bit of that if you pay 100 bucks to upgrade to Windows 10 Pro. So that was something important that we missed that I wanted to uh, follow up with this week. Uh, Mark Fain had a good comment in regards to Chromebooks and their end of life policy. Uh, because we kind of talked about the fact that after a certain number of years, your Chromebook is no longer supported, but it doesn't mean the Chromebook won't work anymore. It just won't get uh, all of the hardware updates specific for that particular model, hardware and software perhaps. But one thing that Mark points out here is that if the Chrome browser itself is still updated, even if the Chromebook itself is no longer supported, that's not such a bad thing. And that's one thing I'm not sure about uh, with these Chromebook expirations. I know it relates to hardware and drivers and stuff, but I'm not sure about the Chrome browser itself. So it looks like if they do continue to update the browser, you probably will get a little bit more life out of it than what we talked about last week. Uh, but let me know down in the comments below if you know that the end of life means the browser and all the hardware drivers and everything, or if it's strictly just the hardware support. Uh, let's have a continued discussion on that down below in the comments. Thomas Woodford had a good thought also about the fact that Windows 7 uh, is about to hit its end of life, and that was something we didn't talk about. So if you go on to the Microsoft uh, Windows 7 end of life page, you'll see that after January 14th, 2020, Microsoft is no longer going to provide security updates or support for PCs running Windows 7. And Thomas here loves his Windows 7. He wants nothing to do with Windows 10. The good news is that even though support ends, Windows 7 still works. But if there are show-stopping security issues, those are not going to get patched and you'll be vulnerable to those. And Microsoft points that out in their support document here. Now, what's tricky about how these end-of-life things work with Windows is that consumer devices will see this happen on January 14th, but uh, those of us who are using Windows Embedded 7 in various applications will have a different end-of-life date. So, for example, my TriCaster that I use to do all my videos is still running Windows 7, but it's the embedded version of Windows 7 that's on a different timeline. So there are some versions of Windows 7 that will continue to get supported for a little bit longer, but at some point they're all going to go away. And let's not forget, Windows is in everything. Billboards on the highway, they're in ATM machines, cash registers, you name it. So at some point, everybody's gonna have to upgrade here. But for now, if you are using uh, some specialized devices with Windows 7 embedded, you will be continually supported, at least for the near future. Now this next question comes in from Brent Johnson in relation to some videos I posted recently about how I organize and watch my uh, personal media. And he wanted to know exactly what I was doing because I am kind of using uh, the HD Home Run DVR for some things and Plex for other things. So I thought I would just give you an overview as to how I currently use Plex personally and some of the features that I make use of. Uh, so when I first got going with Plex, the big thing I wanted to do was uh, just have a nicer way to organize all my movies. I really like how they provide all the metadata for you. So if I go into my uh, movies folder here, I can uh, drill down into all the Blu-rays that I have stored on my uh, network attached storage here on the network. And one of the things that's been great about using Plex on the NVIDIA Shield 
uh, is that I'm able to get 4K movies with HDR uh, as well as Dolby Atmos sound. And I really like that convenience of just being able to uh, turn up a movie whenever I want and uh, have it available on any of my TVs around the house. And the 4K stuff has been just great to have in addition to all of my 1080p content. It's a really killer combination to have all of those things. But I also use the HD Home Run DVR uh, for recording TV shows. And the reason why I still use the HD Home Run DVR system in the house is that it's a lot faster. So I've got my uh, local cable access channel here running on my iPhone, uh, but I can easily switch to another channel here and things just spin up a lot quicker. In fact, uh, on my NVIDIA Shields, things are almost instantaneous, especially when I pull up some recorded content because the HD Home Run system doesn't do any transcoding or anything that slows down the process. It just feeds you whatever it's got. Uh, and as a result, if you're skipping through commercials or just trying to pull up another show, uh, it's like almost instant. You push the button on the shield and then no matter where you are in the house, things just come up and start playing. And I just love that uh, speed of that interface and just how, all, how well everything works compared to how my cable boxes used to work. In fact, my mom's got the X1 operating system from Comcast and uh, my HD home run and shield stuff is faster than what Comcast provides customers. It's really that good. Now where Plex comes into play is that I'm able to point Plex at my HD Home Run DVR recording directory. Uh, so I am running both the HD Home Run recording engine and my Plex server on the same NAS device. So anytime HD Home Run records something, it's available to Plex and I can just pop in and watch this stuff anywhere I go. So if I wanted to see Manifest, for example, I can just tap on this and this is all the stuff that it recorded off the air and I could download it using the offline uh, viewing feature, which is another thing I use quite heavily on Plex, especially when I, I'm traveling. I can put a bunch of shows on my phone and just watch offline on a plane or a train or a car or whatever. Uh, and it just organizes everything just like the HD Home Run does. And I can manage the files from either location. Uh, generally what I do is uh, in the house, watch everything on HD Home Run and then delete from the HD Home Run when I'm done. And then it will uh, update Plex automatically because Plex is always looking in its directory to see what's coming up. But they really do uh, work quite nicely together. And sometimes if I am away from home and I want to catch something on the news or whatever, I can go over to the uh, live TV and DVR feature and then stream live television from my Comcast cable through my HD Home Run Prime and Plex uh, to my phone or computer anywhere I am. And I've done that quite a bit. What I love about Plex is that you can adjust the bit rate. So if I don't really care how good the video quality is, I'll just stream to my phone at a low bit rate just to get an idea as to what's going on. And it's a very flexible way uh, to watch TV remotely. Uh, Comcast does offer a similar service for free that I've used from time to time as well. But I often just go to Plex because I just like it because it's mine. Uh, and I'm able to, again, stream live television through Plex with its real-time transcoding features that uh, my NAS is able to take advantage of. I am starting to do a little bit more with music on Plex as well. We did that video with Tidal the other day, which I'm still uh, trying to figure out if it has a place in my life. Uh, what I like about uh, Plex is that I can store my FLAC audio, my lossless audio from all the CDs I've been starting to archive from my youth. Uh, and that's been kind of a fun project. I really like how it has all the metadata maintained there. Uh, Tidal actually integrates quite well with it. My struggle with Tidal is that I'm on this really cheap, like short-term uh, demo subscription. So I think it ends next month. I was paying $1.99 a month for three months. Uh, and I'm just having a hard time justifying the $20 a month for their lossless audio service. And the reason is, is that most of the time, if I'm in the car or I'm listening to my uh, AirPods or whatever, I'm listening to compressed music anyhow, and I'm not gaining the benefit of this lossless audio. So I'm thinking I'll probably not stick with Tidal and I'll continue archiving all my CDs on Plex for the stuff that I really uh, want to listen to with the best quality from time to time and then uh, use my other subscription services for other things. So that's how I'm using Plex. I would love to hear how you're using it down below in the video description. And in full disclosure, uh, both Plex and HD Home Run are occasional sponsors here on the channel, but they did not sponsor this segment. Now, one of the things that the HD Home Run hardware does is that it compiles a list of all of the available channels it can get uh, so I have the HD Home Run Prime that's hooked up to my cable system and it gives me everything that uh, Comcast offers me, but I don't always want to see that on my channel listings. And there is a way to customize it so that 
Uh, you can remove channels from all the applications that HD Home Run devices support. So let's take a look at how to do that right now. So what you need to do is go to my.hdhomerun.com and what it will do is it will tell you which devices are on your network. And you can see here my HD Home Run Prime is listed. I've got 162 channels available. If I click on that channels option there, uh, you'll see all the available channels that I have uh, on my lineup. And you'll see here that I've got X's through all of these music channels. And the way you do that is pretty simple. You go up to the channel that you want to remove. And I'm actually going to go through a bunch of my uh, SD networks because I don't need to watch a low definition signal here. So what I'm going to do is click on the star and that will make it a favorite. But if I click on it again, uh, that will remove it from the lineup. So now all the software that my uh, HD Home Run device is feeding will no longer be provided these channels. You might have to rebuild your Plex uh, channel list to have these take effect, but this is a great way to just declutter your interface. If there are channels that, for example, you have in high definition that you just don't want to see on your uh, channel grids, uh, you can just go through here and uh, wipe those out and they're gone. And if you want to bring them back, you just uh, unclick the X there and they'll come back again. Uh, some apps allow you to view your favorites. So if you do uh, favorite a channel, uh, so for example, if I did like National Geographic here, uh, that would show up on my list of favorites and could be a little faster to access at certain points. And if the app you're using supports that, uh, your HD Home Run will pass along a list of those favorite channels as well. Pretty simple and worth doing uh, if you want to declutter your interfaces. Now our pick of the week this week is an older game that I picked up on Steam the other day for five bucks. It's called Papers, Please. And some of you may have played with this before. I am enjoying the heck out of this, more so than I thought. So what you are is a border guard at a, like pretty much a dictatorship and you are evaluating all these documents of people trying to get into the country. There's a great story running underneath this where uh, the country has enemies from neighboring countries that are causing problems for them. There's some insurgency developing within the country and then there's a split between another rebel group and the insurgents and there's terrorist attacks and all these other things and you have some control over the story because you can decide to let certain people into the country or not. Uh, you have some pressures of trying to feed your family in addition to maybe taking some extra money on the side from guards who get a bonus when you turn people in for interrogation. It's just a really fun, dynamic, and pretty deep game for a very simple premise. And if you haven't tried this yet, give it a shot. It's on the iPad in addition to Steam, of course, and the system requirements are very minimal. So it'll even run on a lot of those cheap mini PCs we look at uh, from time to time. Fun game, definitely worth checking out if you are into looking at detailed documents and trying to determine whether or not they're legit. So this week on the channel, I've got a couple of things ready to go. We're going to be doing another sponsored video from the Mocha Alliance, and we're going to be looking at uh, how Mocha can be a better way to conduct your live streaming if you are in need of extending your network versus Wi-Fi. Now, of course, Ethernet is always the best way to go for anything, but I know a lot of folks are not able to run Ethernet throughout their home for various reasons. Uh, Mocha works over your cable television wiring, and in every test that we've done, it's been a really good solution, and we'll look at another one of those solutions this week with live streaming. We're also going to be doing a two-parter uh, on the Synology NAS, so hopefully by the time you see this weekly wrap-up, you'll be watching my setup video of it. Uh, and then later this week, we're going to be reviewing this particular NAS device and talking about some of the things the mid to high end Synology devices provide that the lower versions do not. So that one should be pretty fun. And let me know if you want anything specific covered in that video down below in the comments. And we'll probably have a few other things too. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash support and make a monthly or one-time contribution to the channel. We also have our ongoing relationship with Plex, where if you sign up for a free Plex account, no credit card required, we get a small commission. We also get a commission if you sign up for a Plex Pass or gift it to somebody else. And you can find me on a number of other channels as well, including my Extras channel, where we do unboxings and supplementary content. We also did a few uh, little test live streams of that video you go the other day. So just kind of a place where I put stuff in where I want to do some posting, but I don't want to overwhelm the main uh, channel's subscription feed. This is a fun way to get a little bit more out of what I do. Uh, we have my podcast, which is audio versions of this show that gets posted once a week at the link you see there, and you can find it on all of your favorite podcasting applications. We have the Snippets channel, which takes portions of this video and makes them more search-friendly. 
And then we have my live stream archive where I have uh, archived just about every live stream I have done here on the channel. And again, we're maybe going to do some more now that I've got that uh, option for a more reliable streaming connection. If you like what I do, definitely push that notification bell to get a notification every time we upload and do live stuff and whatever. We also have some other ways to engage with the channel. My email list is uh, very easy to sign up for and we don't bombard you with email too often. That's at lon.tv slash email. We have my Facebook page at lon.tv slash Facebook where you can find some supplementary content as well. We have my Facebook group at lon.tv slash Facebook group and we have the store at lon.tv slash store where I sell things that I purchase to review and you can get a notification every time we add something to the store by signing up for a different email list that you'll see up there on screen. And that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Hope you all have a great week and I look forward to reading all of your comments, ideas, suggestions, and even criticisms about my PC building skills down below. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.tv supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Anuj Zaveri, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.